all have fees that <laughs> no one tells you about. Hi everyone, my name is Emma and I am a third year medical student studying in Sydney, Australia. And today I wanted to talk about all of the costs of med school. And no, I don't mean tuition because that can get really expensive and I've talked about that before, but I mean all of the extra costs that no one seems to talk about and unless you know someone that's gone through med school or you watch a video like this, you may be completely caught off guard and not know about. At least I know I was. Now, a bit of a disclaimer, I am an international student. I am from Canada studying in Australia. So some of these fees may not be specific to you, but I did post on my Instagram asking for feedback from med students all over the world that I follow and know. Follow me on Instagram if you want. And I found that all of our experiences were very, very similar. So I think this video is going to be very general in terms of these surprise costs and things that we weren't aware of. And I'm gonna to try to leave sort of tips that I found or a few tricks that I'm aware of as we go through. Granted, some of the costs are things you just have to suck up. So let's start with the sort of startup costs. Um, med school, obviously you have your application fees and then sometimes you have to put down your deposit and the deposit usually goes towards your first tuition payment, but not always. But then once you're accepted, once you have your spot, they ask you to do a lot of things. This can include a police check, getting up-to-date vaccinations, um, doing different certifications like your first aid, your ALS or your BLS, all before you start. And all of those have different costs associated with them depending on where you live or if the school has sort of a group discount or group classes for some of these certifications. I know if you're an international student getting your visa and your health checks for that as well. So all of this sort of pre-work all have fees that <laughs> no one tells you about. <laughs> and then you also have this sort of urgency to get tools and supplies. And medicine's very interesting because we have both the academic need as well as the physical skills. So you do need tools to practice those, such as a stethoscope. I know a lot of students feel really pressed to get a stethoscope right away. And I would say, unless your school absolutely requires that on day one, you have a stethoscope, I would wait to make this purchase. So usually if you're in a postgrad or an undergrad, the first few years of your medical degree will be more sort of academic and classroom based. You might be learning some of these skills, but usually in those clinical tutorials, there will be stethoscopes that you can use sort of like freebies for the school. Now you might have to sanitize them between use, that kind of thing, but you can wait and you don't have to spend this money and drop it on a stethoscope right away. And then that way too, you can ask clinicians, you can ask tutors, What's a good stethoscope? What level should I be looking for? You don't need to run out and grab like a Littman Cardiology 4 or like Master Pro as a medical student. It's just, we just don't have the skills to use it at the level that we need to. And so instead you can ask what's a good option for you as a student and you can make that purchase and kind of save up for it a little bit through your first year of medical school. As well as all the other tools, like I'm sorry, you don't need a neuro kit, a whole neuro kit as a medical student. You just you don't, unless you want to go into neurology. Um, so again, you can see what you need in clinical tutorials, go into the hospital and see what is available and what's not, and ask upper years and ask interns, like what's one thing I should buy as a medical student? Don't buy all of these right away. Your money is better suited elsewhere. Additionally, I would say the same goes for a tool of surgery shoes. So we have to wear sort of clogs or like sanitizable, clean shoes in the OR and often students will feel pressured to spend hundreds of dollars on these clinical shoes even if they don't know if they're going into surgery or not. So I always say unless you know your heart is dead set on surgery and you're going to be trying to apply for that, the Crocs ones are fine as long as they pass all of the requirements closed-toed, comfortable, and sanitizable probably not a word, you'll be okay. And again, you don't need to make this purchase in your first or second year. So wait until your clinical years or before your clinical years, ask your clinical educators what kind you need and go for the less cost option if you can. And shoes kind of leads me into the uh, topic of clinical clothing in general. So clinical clothes can be really expensive, be, especially if you're sort of starting from scratch. Not everybody goes through their undergrad accumulating sort of professional looking clothes. And again, this is something you can sort of build as you go. In your first couple years, you probably won't be in clinic every single day. So it's okay to have one or two set sort of clinic outfits that you wear when you do get to shadow or for your OSCEs and assessments that require professionalism and professional dress. And 
you don't have to go shelling out a whole lot of money for this. Target, Kmart, those kinds of things, I know they're fast fashion, but if it's all you can afford or all you're able to afford at this point, they have good clinical clothing options, good smart casual, good business casual. As well, look on Facebook Marketplace or Depop and other reselling websites because you can find good things that are there that are high quality, might be a brand, not that it's necessary, for less expensive. And then you can kind of create this little collection of things, look for staples. I do have a clinical clothing advice video, check that out, but look for staples, things with pockets and things without sleeves and you'll be good to go. So now let's talk about some of these bigger ticket items, the things that really cost a lot um, that I wish I had some warning for. So as a third year student, I'm currently organizing my electives for fourth year and those cost money. I mean, I know it makes sense. You're going and you're training somewhere other than your home institution, but it just doesn't, it didn't compute in my head. So a lot of these electives have an application fee. Um, so even just applying to ask if they have the time and the space and the option to take you, costs you money and it costs you money towards the end of your third year where you're probably running low on funds um, and then actually even committing to that placement can range in cost. I've seen a few that are $400 for four weeks up to $900 for four to eight weeks and that's not including the administrative fee of about $100 just to apply. And so you have that cost as well as your tuition cost for your fourth year and you have to budget that into the end of your third year to be able to sort of predict how many applications for electives you're going to be doing and things like that. So my best advice for this tip and something I wish I did was directly ask upper year students when I was in year two or, or the beginning of year three, how many applications did you put out for electives? What were they for? And how much did it cost? And how much does it cost to do the elective there? And when you are reaching out to hospitals inquiring or clinical schools inquiring about these electives, ask them up front, is there an administration fee to apply? And how much does this cost? Because then you can start factoring that into your decision making so that if you do fall in love with a program, you're not going to instantly regret it. And then with electives comes moving. Um, so I think something that a lot of people don't talk about in med school is the amount of moving around that you might do. So you may get a rental at the beginning of school right near the hospital that you're placed at or near your sort of education center, and then you could get placed all over the city. Um, and sometimes other cities. And especially during electives, during your final year, you want to be doing sub eyes or interview sort of based electives to try to make an impression, especially if you're in the United States, and you're gonna have to move for that. So you may be paying rent in two places if you have roommates back home that you can't sort of let down, you may have to organize subletting, or you may have to pack up, close this lease, and move to your new place for four to six to eight weeks. Electives aren't that long, and then you have to move again. And with that comes different fees, either storage fees, double rents, or moving fees, and just the time and effort that it takes to go seek out all of these different rentals and these different places. So that's something definitely to consider. Like personally, I would love to do a rural internship, not internship, well, yes, but a rural placement. And I have to keep in mind that during those four weeks, I have to keep my rent here because I have a roommate and cats. Um, and I also will have to pay rent to wherever I go. So that's something to factor into the general cost of that whole elective. And it's not just electives that can get impacted by rent and moving and all of these things. If you have a placement even during your sort of home-based years that is at the other side of the city, you still have to get there. So a lot of students end up buying cars or using their parents' cars, which come with them gas and then parking fees, parking at hospitals. Med students don't often have free parking. And, or if you're not paying to drive there, you're paying to commute there on bus fare and things. As an international student, we pay more in bus fare here, but I know that it's just this slow sort of cost that can just kind of creep up and keep adding and adding. And in general, the time of commuting can't be ignored either. And that leads me nicely into the idea of opportunity costs. So as a medical student, we all know that we're going to be very busy, but some students are able to keep their part-time jobs all the way through. Some people are able to keep the part-time jobs in first and second year and then have to let it go when we enter the wildness that is placements and working sort of normal doctor hours and on-call shifts and it, you just can't organize around that. Or some people have to stop right away. When they get into med school, they can no longer keep their part-time job. And that's entirely valid. And I think it's worth 
understanding and respecting that that amount of time that it takes, commuting time, study time, time to be in class and in on placement and the more than full-time job that it is to be a medical student takes away your opportunity to earn income elsewhere. So it's not necessarily costing you anything extra to be a student other than tuition, etc. but it does cost you time. And that time could be something that brings you income or well-being or a time with friends and family, but it's something that we have to consider as well. And the last and final big ticket item that we're all aware of, licensing exams. And it's a thing that I didn't like compute until sort of finishing up my degree and realizing, oh, I've got to write those if I want. So for example, the USMLE can cost thousands of dollars and you have step one and step two, two parts, and then step three, but at least step three, you've started working, so you're kind of making money. Um, you have the MCCQE if you want to go back through Canada, and then in Australia, you have different applications and different tests as well that you'll have to write to get into your registrar training. And all of those have different supplies and different materials that you may feel sort of pressured to buy and to use to get ready. And then they have just the big ticket of actually sitting and writing them as well as potentially having to go travel to a new city to sit and write it, especially in sort of 2020, 2021, not every testing center was remaining open. So now I wanna talk about some of the little things or like the, Things that just kind of add up and are a bit more inconsequential that we don't really think of as, as expenses, but they do really start to add up. And luckily, this is the one where I have a little bit more tips and tricks. Um, some you've probably already thought of, but at least I can share them. So first and foremost, we have the eating out, the coffees on the go, and the quick meals and things. And again, this ties into that opportunity cost and being a student is hard work, it's busy, you have late hours at the hospital and you have to pick up food, um, and we run on caffeine of all sorts. And the easy fix for that is just don't do that. <laughs> like meal prep and make your coffee at home and yada yada yada, of course. We've all heard that before. Uh, one trick that I do have for meal prepping is I get very bored of my meals very quickly, so I try to make something on Sunday that can be reformatted, so it's not always the same. So for example, I'll make like a roast chicken and potatoes on Sunday so that I can continue to eat the chicken on salads and wraps or mash the extra potatoes throughout the week so it doesn't get so boring. Um, and as for coffee, yeah, make your coffee at home. Um, I'm someone who likes really fancy lattes and things, so I actually got an espresso um, aerator, I forget what they call it, um, and that has changed my coffee game and I can actually make coffees at home. Big startup cost, but it was one of those things that has now meant I don't buy a coffee on the way to work every day. Um, and asking family and friends if they are able to at any sort of gift giving occasion, if you exchange monetary gifts to give you gift cards to delivery food services, coffee shops in your local area or restaurants in your local area, because then it feels like they're able to treat you to something, but it's something you would have bought anyways. And so therefore it's not a cost leaving your wallet. Um, I always say, give me a Starbucks card and I will be a happy camper um, or an Uber Eats or anything like that. And it does really help. It kind of lets you treat yourself without the guilt of spending it. And you can keep it in your back pocket for the days where you forgot to make your coffee or were rushed on the way. Another cost that's not so little, but does add up is textbooks. So your school will have a list of required textbooks. And then there will be all of the extra textbooks that you hear through the grapevine are really good for studying for this or are really necessary if you're interested in this specialty and all of these different things really add up. Um, one thing I will remind you, any textbook that is required text by your institution should be provided at the library. So you do have access to it and they sometimes have online eBooks that you can use and download there. And there's always, you know, I'm not gonna recommend it for the sake of legal issues, but you can find a lot of textbook PDFs online and then you can print them out and then you can use them. There's also, you can go in um, on resources with friends and you can share an account um, for online resources and things like that. And that leads me into all of those supplementary options. So there's things like Osmosis, like Amboss, like all of Sketchy, all of these subscription services that people say you need if you wanna study this or if you wanna pass this test. And of course they can be really helpful. I definitely say take advantage of free trials, 
Make sure you put a reminder in your calendar to cancel those free trials before they charge your credit card um, and see what works for you. Really invest in the time and see and think critically, does this actually help me? Or split it with friends like you would share a Netflix subscription. So make an email account for all of you and you all log in and have one osmosis account and then you can kind of split the cost that way. And then something that one of the people in my poll brought up was events. So med socks and med schools are really great and they host all of these great events and you really want to go to all of them. There's balls, there's galas, there's conferences, and they're all really, really great. But they cost a lot of money. So something I would say looking into is don't be afraid to ask your med sock for a payment plan or if they have options for giveaway tickets or things like that to things like their med ball. And for any conference, ask about your faculty or your school's conference grants for postgraduate students. So if you're doing a postgrad or even an undergrad uh, medical degree, they often have budget available for students to help pay for their conference fees, even if you're not going and presenting. It doesn't hurt to ask, and it could get you some really great opportunities. And always jump on the different socials for your local and your national sort of med sock events and see if they promo free tickets or ticket giveaways and things like that for the stuff that you're really interested in. Again, this is something go in with friends. You can split the hotel room or, you know, make a deal with friends. You go to that conference and tell me how it went and I'll go to this conference and tell you how it went um, and things like that. And finally, these med events and things lead me to something that someone else brought up is the amount of pressure you can feel as a medical student to live a certain way. So med school is very interesting because it's a privilege to be there and it takes a certain amount of privilege to even get in. Um, we have to acknowledge that, which means even if you are sort of on the lower end of privilege in medical school, there are going to be people that just come from a higher socioeconomic status background. And they don't consider these extra costs, so they don't have to. And it can create this culture of medicine where you have to have these resources. You have to have the best tools. You have to be wearing this season's best clinical outfits, or they have to be branded in a certain way. And that can really start to absorb into how you make your financial decisions as you go throughout medical school. And as someone who's fallen guilty to it many, many times and probably contributes to it a little bit with my Instagram and my YouTube channel, I think it's really important to address that and to address that there is no right way to go through medical school. Getting through medical school and getting into the job or the position that you are interested in is the right way. So if you're looking at purchasing something, reflect on is this just because everybody else has it or is this because it's actually going to be something useful to me? And it's something that I'm still working on myself. But I just think it's important to recognize that med school can have a bit of a capitalistic, money-focused culture and we need to remove ourselves from that every once in a while, especially when it comes to financial ability and sort of financial freedom to spend on what we want to spend. So normally I would end these videos hopefully with more tips. I hope you found some of those helpful, but I hope in general just listing out some of these expenses was useful to you because I know it's something that has snuck up on me time and time again in medical school and I really wanted to share it with anybody early in their med career or looking into med school. If you are a medical student, please make sure to comment down below any other expenses that have come up for you or other strategies that you have found to pay for things. And if you aren't a medical student or you're interested in med school, please comment down below any questions that you have. If you like this video, then show it to me, give it a like and make sure you are subscribed. Um, again, my name's Emma, and I will see you in the next one. Bye.